I love, uh, I've been able to share a couple times on Sunday night, uh, this series, and um, this morning it's a thrill to share, really around how the person of the Holy Spirit is good news, because I think a lot of Christians live in between the two times. We live in between the time of Jesus. We talk a lot about the life of Jesus. We talk about and we think about, and some of us might dream about what it would have been like to sit under his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, or what it would have been like to walk with him and talk with him. And we forget that Jesus actually said, it's better that I go. It's better that I go because I'm sending the Spirit, the Counselor, And he will be not just like me to you. He will be be like me to all of you. Not just the 12. But he will actually be better than that because he won't just be with you. He will be in you. And so Jesus spoke glowingly about the Holy Spirit. And so we don't live in this this in-between time. It's like there was the time of the first coming of Jesus and then we are waiting his second coming. No, today we live with the presence of God with his people. We're not just waiting the Messiah. He has come and he is with us. God is with us through the Holy Spirit. And I think that that means that rather than just lamenting that Jesus isn't with us or looking forward to when Jesus returns, we can thank God that the Spirit of God is at work in creation. He's at work in you and I, and he is bringing things to their telos, their goal. That actually everything around us is heading towards a goal. Isn't it good to have a goal? So so what it means is that even the ups and downs are all heading towards something that's purposely and fulfilled and complete. That the earth is not just a random spiraling um, sphere of randomness. There's actually a purposefulness to creation. There's a purposefulness to you and I. And the Spirit of God who is there at creation is here today and He is bringing it to an end and He's going to be with us. The one constant in your life is not the person of Jesus, because he's with the Father praying for you, but in terms of the presence of your life, is the Spirit. He's actually with you right now, and he's going to be with you forever and ever. Amen. That's amazing. So we should be better at talking about the Holy Spirit. We should be better at talking about his supernatural aspects and also the natural aspects of the Holy Spirit. You see, sometimes I think we can miss, we can forget that there's, a close connection between the supernatural and the natural. In fact, the book of Acts is an incredible book because it has some incredible um, history-making encounters, like the story of Pentecost and some amazing miracles. And then it has so much detail in it that you think, why, Luke, did you put that detail in there? It's like, they went here, they went there. You know, they ate this for breakfast and they ate this for lunch. And you're thinking too much information. Can you just give us the highlights package, please? And Luke records in the book of Acts so much detail about the apostles, their their missionary journeys, um, their high points, and he seems to also accentuate their low points as well. And so that there's this dynamic aspect of the the spectacular and the natural coming together in the book of Acts. It's almost like God was saying through... uh, Luke, as he wrote it down, he was, and, and through the record of the early church, saying, I want my church for always, for all time to remember that there is a dynamic, supernatural, miracle working aspect to the life of the Spirit, but there's also an aspect to life in the Spirit that is really ordinary. And it reflects your day in, your day out reality. Some of it will be instantaneous, some of it will be take a long time. Sometimes there'll be suffering, sometimes there'll be miracles. Sometimes there'll be both at the same time. I was just talking to my mum uh, the other day, yesterday maybe, about a recent holiday that she had. And she had come back from Perth, and she had eight days there. And I said, Mum, I haven't talked to you. Tell me about the trip. And then for the next ten minutes or so, don't tell her I told you this, um, she proceeded to tell me about everything that went wrong on the flight home. (laughs) And so... Um, there was an evacuation. I don't know if it was a terrorist threat or something like that, but 
the whole airport had to be evacuated, which is not a great thing when you're flying from Perth to Sydney. And um, it got delayed and then they missed their flights. And she was telling me, my mum, she, she's got so much compassion for people that she said, oh, there was this poor girl and she was flying back to Sydney and she missed her Connect flight to America. And there was this other poor chap who had been away from his kids. And there was another single mum with her kids. And I was just, my heart went out to her and she was at the airport and everyone's on the floor. And I got so much detail about the jolly flight back. And I said, mum, tell us about your holiday. And it reminded me of that um, part of the castle where Eric Banner's character, you know, where they come back from their honeymoon and they're, they're telling the story about their great overseas adventure and they're just talking about the movies they watched. Um, Dale asks, what movie did you watch on the plane? And he just wants to know about the movie they watched on the plane. They don't want to know about anything else. And <clears throat> but, but life is like that. Life is a mixture of weddings, funerals, amazing things and also just boring everyday life. And just the regular habits of everyday life. And I think whenever you get presented with a picture of the world that is just the highlights package, it can separate you from the real grind of Monday to Friday spirituality and following Jesus. And that's what I love about the book of Acts. It's not disconnected from the real life grind of following Jesus. Um, In the book of Acts, in Acts 15 verse Uh, 28. There's just been this great council in Jerusalem where the early church, an episode that could have split the church in two between different factions over how much of the, uh, the Jewish religion and the Mosaic law had to be maintained for Gentile followers of Jesus. And so there's this great council of the early Christian leaders to say, we need to be on the same page so when we're speaking to Gentiles, we're able to tell them Gentiles, non-Jews, about what they actually have to live out according to the Old Testament law. And how much, you know, do they have to be circumcised or do they have to not be circumcised? Like, what's the, what's, are we going to be on the same page on that? And so this great council of Jerusalem, they had meetings and they had deliberations and there would have been different factions and different perspectives. And how many of you love long, intense meetings? Do you ever just stay you in a meeting and you think, man, I feel alive in the middle of this meeting? That's exactly how I always feel like that when I'm in a meeting here at church because we have such great teams and Pastor Bill is such a great boss and it's never boring. And, uh, but you know what? Sometimes, it's interesting, at the end of this meeting they wrote a letter out to some of the churches and they said, we need to tell you what's come out of this meeting and it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us that you do these things. And the picture was this, that as a result of wrestling with the truth and being open to God in prayer and wrestling with the scriptures and hearing from the different voices, at the end of this meeting, they said, we feel like the Spirit of God has prompted us as a group and this is what the Spirit's doing. Let me tell you, in the everyday grind, in the process, in meetings, the Spirit of God is at work. You know, I know some pastors and they're like, you know what, I never um, prepare, you know, weeks or months in advance, but it's all about, I just get, get up there and I just speak about what the Spirit's speaking to me on the spot. It's almost like planning is unspiritual. What a load of rhubarb. Who says that the Spirit of God can't inspire you in a planning process? Who says that the Spirit of God can't inspire you with wisdom ahead of time? And do you know what? If we plan a preaching series a month or two or three out, it doesn't mean that we are forced to do it. If Pastor Bill one night wakes up with a dream or a vision and God speaks to him saying, you must preach on this, do you know what? The senior pastor, he jolly well better speak on what God tells him to speak on. But how many of you know that God doesn't speak with dreams and visions every Saturday night before a Sunday sermon? And I know some churches, and, and it's like, man, the pastor, they just preach on the same thing all, because the church gets what the pastor's hobby horse is rather than preaching the whole counsel of God. And rather than actually being wise and discerning and realizing that God doesn't just speak to you, He speaks to us. So sometimes there's a process, there's a slowness, there's a, there's a, a working through. What is God speaking to us collectively about? And then the next chapter in Acts chapter, yeah, the next chapter after that, it's speaking about some of the apostles. They were about to head into the Asia, Asia Minor area, and it says that they were kept from going into Asia by the Spirit. And then it says that they were, the Spirit wouldn't allow them to go into Asia. 
to, to another region. What does it mean to be kept and to not be allowed and to be prevented by the Spirit of God? I don't think that it's saying that God spoke to them with dreams or visions or an audible voice. I think that as they were moving, there were circumstances and there was promptings in their spirit and they just thought, you know what? We don't feel right about proceeding down this road any longer. There's something in us that we just feel like we feel sick, we feel uneasy, and there was a prompting, there was something. We don't know exactly in the text, but they were kept from going there. There might have been some circumstances, and rather than saying, we believe that God is going to give us power and strength and wisdom to overcome these circumstances and overcome these barriers, they sense, no, no, we actually feel that we need to head in another direction. Because God can speak through promptings. And um, we read that in the story of the Philippian jailer in... um, in, in around that same chapter, in fact, the Philippian jailer comes to Christ because the, the because the apostles are let free from prison, and rather than run away and rather than escape, they stay, and they minister to him, so he won't be executed. And why did they stay? I think they got a prompting from the Spirit because there's other examples in the Scriptures where people are released from prison and they escape. What caused them to stay and minister to this poor man? I believe they got a prompting from the Holy Spirit. And it says that he and his whole household were baptized. And we don't know what God did in that man and his household to form and to be foundational in the Philippian church. You see, God speaks to us sometimes through processes, sometimes through wrestling with things uh, in groups with the people of God. Sometimes he speaks to us through promptings just in our heart and we know what we need to do. You see, I preached a couple of weeks ago on a Sunday night that if, if in the book of Romans it says that the law of God is written in our hearts. The law of God is written in our hearts, so we're without excuse. Even people that have never heard about Jesus have the law of God written on their hearts. What I believe to be true is that most people in most circumstances know right from wrong. Most people. And the Spirit of God, rather than giving us weird and wacky revelations, He just confirms the law of God. He confirms the Word of God in our hearts. Now the problem is we don't want to hear that and that's what the Holy Spirit does. He prompts us and he confirms things that are in accordance with the person of Jesus and the scriptures. That's how he leads us. But then, right after that, the very next verse, it says that Paul has a vision with a man from Macedonia saying, come here, and then they go to Macedonia. And we know that Macedonia Macedonia became a, a Christian place after that. You see, God can speak through processes and through people. He can speak through promptings and just a sense of, God, I believe you're calling me to do this. And he can speak through dreams and visions. And you could, should expect him to speak to you in all of those ways. And there is a dynamic to life in the Spirit that is spectacular. That is, it's like dreams and visions and miracles. And wow, I didn't expect that. And there's also a sense that God is at work in the nitty gritty and in the, let's say it, the boring that God is actually at work in the boring because there's parts of this life that won't always be on your terms. What does it mean to live a spirit-filled life? I believe that a spirit-filled life, that it changes the way we pray. In Acts 4, verse 29 to 31, it says this, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Two chapters earlier, the Pentecost outpouring of the Spirit upon all flesh. Thousands come to Christ in one moment. One of the greatest revivals in history, one of the greatest miracles that we see in the Bible, the great culmination of the prophecy from the book, from the book of Joel, that the Spirit of God, it wasn't just that people would be saved, people would come to God, it would be that God's very Spirit, and in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God always means the presence of God, that God's presence would be poured out upon all people. That had happened already. And so that glory of Acts chapter 2 becomes the fearful imprisonment of Acts chapter 4. And the people of God are reeling. And they're in a room. And when you and I, we would want to focus on all of the circumstances. God, change this circumstance. God, change that persecution. God, my family is rejecting me. God, I feel sick and I'm not getting better. God, I'm going to focus on all the things that aren't right. What they do is they huddle in this room after um, Peter and John are released from prison and it says, stretch out your hand. Sorry, it says, enable your servants to speak your word with boldness. 
You see, I believe as a church, if we want to be a spirit-filled church, truly, we are not going to be a church that is obsessed with our circumstances or the things we want to change. Because God cares about those things just like you do. But I believe what God really wants to do is give us a conviction and a passion and say, God, even if nothing changes in my circumstance, I want you to use me, please. God, even if I'm having a year from hell, I believe that you can redeem it and you can give me a passion to speak something of truth. That even though I feel like I'm going through a hellish experience, there's other people going through hell in this world and I don't want to be mute. I want to have something to share of hope. I want to have something to share of life. I want to have something to share that, 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 you know what, this pain is not the end. You see, God can change the way we pray. And so it says, they say, we want to have passion. Help us to speak your word with boldness. Stretch out your hand and heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your servant Jesus. You know what I notice? I believe this to be fact. If you pray this this week, God give me boldness to share your love with people and God give me an opportunity to see your healing power and love flow through me to other people there's a whole heap of prayers that I can't guarantee God will answer this week but probably and unfortunately for some of us that want to live comfortable lives God will answer this prayer but it's not about you and in the midst of saying God I can't believe I got to pray for that person God I can't believe I got to have that that significant conversation God I can't believe even though I was going through a week from hell there was still good that came out of it in the midst of that God changes the focus of our circumstances sometimes our circumstances will change and sometimes they won't but we will change and then what happens after the prayer after the prayer they are filled with the spirit again The New Testament pattern is not about one-off experiences. The New Testament pattern is desperate people saying, I am nothing without you, God, and I need a fresh infilling of your spirit. I'm not going to get drunk on wine. I'm not going to get full of drugs to try to uh, make myself get through life. I am going to be full of your spirit, and I need it day in, day out. And said the room they were in was shaken. I believe spirit-filled people pray different kinds of prayers. I remember once when I was a teenager, um, there was a guy that came out for prayer at a camp I was on, and he came out the front, and he was he was worshiping God, and I just felt prompted by God to pray for him. And I wasn't a leader on the camp. And I came out the front and I laid hands on him and prayed for him. As soon as I touched him, he fell to the ground like b- biblical style, and started shaking. I'm like, oh wow, what did I do? And um, it's never happened again. Um, but it was like a, it was an authentic kind of encounter. This guy was, and he started repenting and breaking down, and overwhelmed by the power of this, the Holy Spirit. He couldn't stand up. But you know the funny thing after that, I had all these people coming up to me wanting me to pray for them. I was 16 years old. And like, the funny thing is, it didn't happen to other people. <laughs> and, that, and, and, and I think sometimes we're like, you know what? Oh, I've got to that spirit-filled person because they get all their prayers answered. Let me tell you, if I got some of the most... See, the way the Apostle Paul talks about spirituality is different to us. To be a spiritual person in the New Testament is to be someone that obeys and is surrendered to the Holy Spirit. So what does it mean to be a spiritual person? It's to be a godly person. So if I was to get some of the most godly men and women in our church up here, I reckon if I rolled out their pain and suffering, it would be more than a lot of, a lot of the rest of us. So godliness and spirituality is not the absence of pain and suffering... But it's the presence of saying, God, I want to be used by you, no matter what. And, um, and so part of being people of the Spirit is being people that recognize that there is a painfulness to the presence of God sometimes. Even when God is with us, there can be a painfulness. Acts 14, listen to this, Paul. Um, sorry, it says, verse 9, Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back to the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. Now, if I was stoned to death, I would want more than one sentence put in the Bible. You know, I would like a whole chapter at least. You know, like, like Stephen's stoning in Acts chapter 7. It's kind of like, give it some profile, please. Don't just make it a little footnote. I mean, if you're skim reading, if you're just like, oh, I've got to get to the end of the chapter, you just skip over it. Because the chapter before... In um, Lystra, it says that the apostles were about to be stoned 
and they got this insight and they were able to escape. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that car park. Praise the Lord. You know, like, oh, God has been so good to me. He really answered my prayer. He, I, I escaped death. Praise the Lord. So out of the frying pan into the fire, full on. And then they come to, um, <laughs> and then they come to um, this new town. No, that was Iconium. And then this is Lystra. And it says he was stoned and they thought he was dead. I mean, he must have been so messed up that they thought he was dead. But he wasn't. As he was lying there on the ground, knocked up by rocks, the Spirit of God was as alive in him as the, chap- as the bit before when he escaped. He looked like he was dead. And after that, Paul and the other apostles, they go and they perform amazing signs and wonders and he writes incredible books of the Bible and arguably his most significant ministry was still to come. We could look at that and say that is an absence of the Spirit, but let me tell you, the Spirit of God was alive in him as he was groaning on the ground. The Bible has a lot to say about groaning. Isn't that a great word? (laughs) Sometimes you don't have words, you just groan. It's like me when I wake up in the morning. Really? In Romans 8.22, it says that creation groans. We see that in our planet, don't we? Our planet is groaning. Our society is groaning. It says that we groan inwardly. I would like to add that some of us groan groan outwardly. And verse 26 of Romans 8 says, The Spirit helps us when we don't know what to pray, and He intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. You know, some of us in this room, the Spirit of God is actually able to be most acutely experienced in the midst of the dark times. But it's when you've only got, you've got nothing left. You're on the ground, you're bloodied and you're bruised. Everyone thinks you're dead, but you're not. And all you can let out is a groan. And it says the Spirit of God in that moment is interceding for you. And I believe in those moments where all we can do is pray in tongues because we can't pray in English because we're so cross or we're so upset that we've got no words. When all we can do is cry out, all we can do is lament what we wish was different. But in that moment, God is alive in us. And I don't know about you, but have you ever experienced a time where you thought that God had forsaken you, where you thought you were utterly alone? But in that moment, you knew that you were not alone and you knew that that groan of your life was not the end, that it was just a sign that the groans are going to finish one day. That there is a time coming where all pain and all suffering will be removed. And so that where other people might groan without hope, you groan with hope. You know, one of the interesting things about going to pregnancy classes before you have your first baby is um, they sit down and they talk to you about the whole birthing process. And, and for, for young dads, it's just like, oh my gosh, this is like a whole new world. And I remember the midwife talking about the difference between good pain and bad pain. And they said, you know, when a woman is giving birth to a baby, it's good pain. And the contractions are good because it's a sign that there's a healthy process going on and, and that baby is actually heading towards its goal. And, but then there's bad pain, you know, like that you just go to the doctor for, okay? And, and so when a woman is giving birth to a baby, don't remind her that this is good pain. <clears throat> But, but, but isn't that true? Do you know how I know it's good pain? Because a lot of women have more than one baby. If it was left to men, every family would be single child. Because we are not strong enough. But, but that's the thing. There is a difference between good pain and bad pain, and it's got a complete, completely to do with where we're going. Is there actually hope for a time where there will be no pain? Is there actually hope that there will be a day when justice and righteousness will be restored on this planet? Is there a time where we will be one with God and he will wipe away every tear and he will restore the broken and lost things? Listen to this. This is amazing. Acts 20 verse 22. I don't have it up there. This is the Apostle Paul. Now compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. 
However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete my task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. You see, those early Christians, they knew that being a spiritual person, being led by the Spirit, would lead them into difficulties. And they did it anyway. I think about some of these people that um, Pastor Bill and Kathy were just sharing about in, in Athens, working with the refugees. Do you not think that some of these people could get easier lives? If they stayed with orthodoxy or if they stayed with their family and if they weren't working with refugees and they weren't struggling for money, they could have had easier lives, but they chose to pursue and to be obedient to the promptings of the Spirit. That is what it means to live a Spirit-filled life. I believe also that there is a significance in the ordinary for the spirit-filled person. A a significance in the ordinary. If we have a look at Acts 28, I'm going to finish with this. Paul um, and some of his friends have been shipwrecked. It says this, Once safely on shore, we found out the island was called Malta. Anyone here from Malta? Um, the islanders show us, showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us, all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself to his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he escaped from the sea, the goddess Justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their mind and said he was a god. (laughs) It's like they think you're cursed and then they think you're a god. I like that. You see, Paul, if you read through the book of Acts, you see shipwreck, you see stonings, you see betrayals. And it's like if it's not bad enough after you're shipwrecked, and you meet the local islanders, and then you get bitten by a snake. I mean, talk about the randomness. It's like you understand why people say that there's no justice in this world. If a loving God existed, why would God allow a good man to get shipwrecked? Why would God allow a good man to get bitten by a snake? Um, And in the midst of that, we go on to read that there's a great healing revival that takes place in Malta. Just through one encounter, through a healing. And then it says that it's like all of the island starts flocking to Paul and he starts praying and ministering and there's a great outbreak of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting that the island of Malta today is a deeply Christian place that has been spiritually affected for a couple of thousand years by this encounter. Um, Paul is the patron saint of Malta because of this. I was also reading in Acts chapter 8 about Philip speaking to the Ethiopian eunuch. And he has an encounter with this Ethiopian eunuch and he's, he's instructed to go and stand next to a horse and cart. And it's like, imagine if God spoke to you, Philip, because he was speaking to Philip. And he said, go and stand over here. And Philip's like, no, do I, I don't really want to do that. I've got other things to do. Anyway, he stands there. And as he stands here, he hears an Ethiopian dude reading from the book of Isaiah, like a messianic passage. And then the guy goes, can you explain this to me? And it says he explains to him about the story of Jesus. And then they go for a little ride together. They see some water and they're like, let's just get baptized right now. I love that story. Some of you just need to get baptised. <laughs> and they get baptised, and tradition has it that he went back to his home country, and Ethiopia has been, you know, essentially or nominally a Christian country for 2,000 years. <laughs> I heard an amen from, oh, I heard an amen from Gannett. But isn't that awesome? Do you believe that God can change individuals and families and nations through simple promptings of the Holy Spirit by Philip to go and stand next to that jolly horse and cart? And and by Paul, the apostle, 
being shipwrecked and just doing some things and being in a position of obedience to God where he went and he experienced suffering, but he didn't give in and God used him to touch a nation and an island. And God knows only what good has come from those encounters. I just was thinking, you know, just recently, our very own Carolyn Hutchfield was, I think it was a church on a Sunday and she went, she was on her way home and had a whole pile of other things she wanted to do and had a prompting to go to a particular playground. She didn't want to go there. She didn't have a need to go there. But she was obedient to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. She went to a playground and randomly met a woman there and had a very spiritual, spiritual encounter with this uh, woman that was going through a challenging time. And last week, I believe that woman... I don't even know if you're here today. I'd love to meet after the service. I was driving down the road, saw cars in here, and it came to church on Sunday. Don't tell me that God isn't speaking more often than what we give him credit for. You see, what I said before at the start of my message about praying prayers of openness, praying prayers of boldness, we had a ministry director's meeting on Tuesday night, and we prayed at the end of the meeting. We didn't give God a list of needs. We actually said, God, we want to pray that you fill us and that you give us boldness for what's ahead. And we had a great time of praying and interceding and praying in the Spirit. And, uh, and, and I saw poor Shay Drew there, and she looked very tired. But she went to school the next day and got to school early, and a teacher walked in and said, Shay, I've got some questions for you. One of my friends has recently been healed like through prayer healing. Can you tell me, what do you think about healing? And then she says, I also want to know about speaking in tongues. Can you explain it to me? And then they sat down and they had a half an hour conversation. Don't tell me that you can't be a magnet for having meaningful encounters with people, not by having all the answers, just by being open and saying, God, I want to, have, I want to be someone that speaks about your love and speaks about your goodness. And I want to be someone, reach out and stretch your hand to perform signs and wonders through me, not for my sake, but for the sake of people. 